Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. I uh, feel at home. I was in this very same beautiful, beautiful auditorium about three and a half years ago. And it's good to be back. It's really good to be back. Well, I have only one problem. Is that you beat the Lakers last week <laughs> after two overtimes. I have a real problem there. But I have to say you have a good team. My uh, presentation tonight may uh, surprise some of you because I, I'm uh, going to attempt to package in a relatively short period of time a lot of feelings and emotions and concerns and ultimately focus on to some successful stories. Remember, for some of you who may have been here four years ago, and I hope there are many, which means you're happy to be back. I mentioned very specifically that when I was a child, when I was a kid, my parents, my father, pushed me overboard. And as I started exploring the French Riviera, I uh, realized that we were in the process of trashing the ocean, using it as the universal sewer dumping things way out there, either purposely or not, and with the very, very strong attitude that out of sight, out of mind. Well, then I realized that in the process of growing up and being where we are, which is definitely better than where we were during the Stone Age, we have disconnected ourselves from what makes us enjoy being alive, and that's nature. We are no longer a real intricate part of nature. In that very, very short period of time that human beings have been on our planet, we, three and a, three and a million years or so, we have gone from being in difficulty, being in real trouble, by barely surviving, very ill-equipped, no claws, no teeth, no fur to speak of, hiding in caves here and there, and uh, ultimately managing to, as a species, to survive. And then finally, when we put together that brain and those wonderful tools together, we started building the world in which we are. Today, we are disconnected from that world. Uh, the world of nature. We hide in beautiful clothes, in air-conditioned uh, buildings. We go fast from one place to another with different modes of transportation. And little by little, we have found ourselves totally cocooned away from nature, to the point where uh, we jump when we see a spider, we uh, kill the mosquito, and we're scared of everything. So we really not well prepared to cope with nature if we were to be dumped in the forest, in the jungle, the middle of the Amazon, for, ex for example. And that's a pity, because it really happened within the last oh, few thousand years, maybe a few hundred years, essentially. And I think it's very important that now that we have found a way to have the quality of life that we have, for us all to rediscover nature and manage these resources for the quality of our lives and for future generations. As we very well know, more diverse the communities of this planet, plants and animals, more stable the system is. And when you realize that you lose perhaps 27,000 species of plants and animals every year, it's a little bit frightening because it weakens the stability of our planet system. We cannot, for those who, 
away from religion from a pure um, evolutionary point of view in the scientific terms, we cannot ignore where we're coming from as matter is concerned. If you go back to the very origin of life on this planet, it was a bunch of atoms which were bumping into each other and uh, whether they were oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen or carbon, as they bump into in each other on the surface of this planet, ultimately they combined and at some point life appeared, plants or animals. And then death takes place and they disappear, they go back to being atoms and these same atoms bump into each other and another formula takes place and another form of life appear, whether plants or animals. And that happened for three and a half billion years until it was our turn. And if you think about what has happened, you fundamentally realize that we made the matter from which we made is the same as those atoms that made other life elsewhere in the past. So in each and every one of us, there's a little bit of a whale, a little bit of a butterfly, a little bit of a dinosaur, a little bit of a rose, a little bit of these flowers. We are all made of the same things. And as such, we are all related. As amazing as it may sound, we have a cousins and aunts and uncles and we are a big huge family whether the humans are not. And that is the connection which makes all of us so close to one another. And sometimes there are funny things that happen. Funny things that happen to the point where you wonder how this form of life can take place. And I'd like to show you some of that by calling the film, the, next, uh, the, the first film, as I introduce you to sea dragons. I was down in South Australia and there I realized that there were some very, very unusual creatures. I'm trying to <laughs> turn this off. Here we go. Could we have the film, please? In South Australia, when we came with uh, our, uh, my father's experimental windship, we um, decided to go after the sea dragons. And the sea dragons are unique to this part of the world. There's two different categories, two species. The ones that uh, are called the weedy sea dragons and the other ones are called the leafy sea dragons. And you'll see the difference in a moment. We were fascinated by that creation. And here we are on our, our experimental vessel going into uh, those cold waters of uh, South Tasmania and uh, looking for the elusive sea dragon. We're looking in that particular part of the world, we're looking at the weedy sea dragon. And uh, we put our uh, equipment, they are uh, wet suits, although we could have used dry suit, but temperature is cold, but not that cold. We're there in the middle of the summer, so it's not unbearable. And uh, we find it more comfortable, more convenient to use wet suits. So here we go uh, down into uh, this uh, cold environment where there are large schools of fish and where you can also uh, glide in the middle of the undersea forests uh, which are the kelp forests. Not unlike what you find along the west coast of the United States or in uh, South America. And as we explore looking for these uh, elusive creatures, we um, encounter all kinds of other creatures which seems to be coming from 
the tropics. And that was kind of a surprise for us as uh, we went down there. Here are some fishes which uh, we've seen in uh, more temperate and definitely also uh, tropical waters. So it, it is interesting to see that uh, although we can qualify this as cold temperate water, there really uh, are certain currents which are going to bring uh, warm, warm currents are going to bring certain species which may not be there during the winter. Some of them have ne perhaps never seen a human being and as such they are extremely uh, uh, friendly. Very curious about fingers, well, an occasionally gentle bite, but nothing to be worried about. So we keep looking, and here's another kind of uh, boxfish or cowfish, which uh, uh, is very surprising in these waters. I was expecting different species. But we are looking because we know that's, that's the environment in which they, they evolve and often hide for that weedy sea dragons. And that's not a sea dragon, that's a seahorse, a big yellow seahorse. Seahorses will hang on to things so they don't drift, so they don't they're not washed away and when they decide to uh, hang on they do so but they are of a fairly large size now you're looking at one which seems to be maybe pregnant interestingly enough uh, in the case of the, the uh, seahorses and the sea dragons the male is the one who carries the babies. It's kind of nature's revenge. <laughs> they camouflage extremely well, and here one of our uh, person in charge of lighting is calling our attention to this very, very pregnant male. Now the babies are, or the eggs, uh, which are incubated until they hatch, are uh, contained in a pouch on the tummy of, of uh, the seahorse. That is not the case with sea dragons, as we will see in a moment. Here is a gentle ray, uh, which are very common on the ocean floor. We're still looking for the sea dragon. And sometimes we uh, get lost in some of the kelp. This is uh, what, when you take your certification in scuba diving, uh, the instructors teach you not to do. <laughs> Finally, as we, uh, in this case, I make my way out of it, uh, one of our divers points out to this very, very strange location where for the first time we see the sea dragon appear. It looks like it's made out of three different parts. It's probably a committee that got together and <laughs> decided to invent the sea dragon. Uh, nature has sometimes great surprises. And remember those atoms bumping into each other? Well, at some point, maybe a mistake took place, and uh, this is what came out. Uh, it could have been us. We could look like this. <laughs> Remember, this is a cousin on aunt or an uncle or all of the above. So don't make fun of these guys. They have the right to exist too. But it is very uncommon. They're extremely slow. They are apparently are not very good to eat for other species and perhaps that's why they're still around. 
But what's interesting, as we see our divers mesmerized by these creatures, is that uh, the Chinese are extremely attracted by the sea dragons. So much so that they are today protected. It is an endangered species, and no one is, without a permit, allowed to even touch them. Uh, we were there with a scientist who is an expert in sea dragons, believe it or not, and uh, down in South Australia. Ultimately, uh, we decide to uh, see how they behave, and very soon I thought I was in charge and in control of my uh, diving team, but very soon I realized that every one of my divers was busy with his own sea dragon. And <laughs> here they were, each of them having control of a sea dragon. <laughs> so I lost control like there completely. Fortunately, uh, we had a scientist who <laughs> wanted to do something and ultimately is going to capture one in a plastic bag. So the water in which the sea dragon is captured is there too. Understand that the uh, Chinese love to dry them up and hang them around their neck uh, to carry them around because it was uh, for good luck. We tried some uh, experiments. Do they react to shiny objects? No reaction whatsoever. What goes on in that brain? I, I have no idea. <laughs> but he's my cousin. This is one way they swim when they go fast. <laughs> Here's our friend capturing one. He's a real hero and puts, puts it in that plastic bag. And uh, Rudy, our scientist, will uh, go to the surface. The um, Chinese also dry them up, grind them, make a powder, and put it on their head uh, so to not lose their hair. Uh, all of that, of course, is nonsense, and that's probably why they've been protected. But here he is in a tank, and oh surprise, as we captured him, whether it was in his, in his uh, presence or it was an accident, we also captured a few babies. And you're going to see that's his mouth, which he's going to use to suck blind shrimps and tiny little creatures, and that's how they feed. And you're going to see one of the babies coming nearby, so you have an idea of scale. These uh, sea dragons can be all oh, something like maybe 12 inches. Very interesting decor, and then the patterns change on the tummy, and as you keep going down, uh, you notice that uh, there's a tail and there are these funny fins. That's part of their propulsion system, very important. It uh, allows them to move about very uh, gently. And there are additional uh, pectoral fins near the gills or the, in the area of the gills behind the head, and that allows or help them orient themselves. Long snout, and you're going to see how that snout works. Look at these little white specks. Here's a baby, so that gives you a, an idea of the size, and he's going to catch this little white speck. This is a little blind shrimp, and he's going for it. Don't blink, otherwise you're going to miss it. It is extremely fast. Gone. Now you have two more chances. So keep your eyes open because he's still very hungry. You see this one? Gone. One more chance and I give up. Gone. Well, that's how they feed. And uh, now he's hanging around a piece of kelp near maybe one of his immediate parents, who knows? Look at the structure of that creature. Weedy is a perfect name. 
Then ultimately we take him back, and uh, all of them back, and release them uh, where we found them. And <laughs> they're on their merry way after probably having a nightmare with their cousins and uncles and <laughs> half-brothers. Allow me to now take you to another part of the world, not very far from Tasmania, but we are in South Australia, where there you find the weedy sea dragon. And here is a weedy sea dragon uh, escaping. It's a major undertaking for a chief diver who is attempting to follow it. Not too bad of a job. And here he is in his uh, total motion. Well, ultimately, we're going to capture one and put it in a tank because we will find a pregnant daddy. Remember, the males are the ones who give birth. And in this particular case, the female will lay the eggs on the outer tummy, which has a very sticky membrane. And as the eggs come in contact with that membrane, they will be stuck there until birth. So here's Don, who uh, has been chasing these guys. He's exhausted by now. Total camouflage, they are extremely uh, well designed for camouflage. Aesthetically, they're not as colorful as the the uh, weedy sea dragon, but they are, I think, more elegant. And uh, all of that to, again, emphasize the fact that uh, I don't know what they were before, before they became sea dragons, but uh, again, nature has a way of doing some interesting design. So here we are now in a tank with that scientist, and you can see the mobility of the eyes, which are independent from each other, so they can supervise what's going on in that environment. Uh, it is very well camouflaged with this uh, kind of makeup that uh, allows the potential predator not to see where the eye is, and eventually the Sea dragon can swim in a direction which may not be expected by the predator. And now you're looking at his tummy, and on the tummy there are all these eggs which are sitting there. Incubation is approximately six weeks. You can already see some of the eyes inside or behind the membrane or behind the egg sacs. Now, I've witnessed birth. And I feel horrible because every time there's contraction and one of the eggs bursts open and the male daddy is doing that many, many times. Could you imagine the pain of giving birth like that? Well, this is how they look like very, very complex design. There's not two alike. And I remember listening with a, um, a microphone which was submerged in the tank. And every time one of these little eggs would open up, it, the, there would be a cracking sound, a very small cracking sound. And ultimately, the Babies and the father are taken back into that environment once uh, Rudy is done with his experiment. So I wanted to um, give us a chance to see the diversity of life in the ocean and uh, knowing where, where the origin of all of this come from, uh, perhaps reconnect with nature and we discover that world which uh, makes us happy and smile, uh, allow the quality of the air we breathe to uh, provide life, uh, allow the quality of the water, the fresh and salt water, 
uh, which we completely depend upon to uh, be of sufficient quality for life to continue to happen. To, uh, happen. All again to insist and emphasize that all of that is not just out there and can be used and abused. It needs to be properly managed. And as the world's population is increasing presently at a rate of approximately 90 million people a year, which means that in three years we have a new United States of America population somewhere, uh, so there's a lot of demand. The pressure is mounting and if we want to keep the quality of, of the life that we have and pass that on to the next generation, uh, we have to do something. And you know, for the majority of my life, since I've had the privilege of growing up with my father and being exposed to the ocean world and then make up my own mind on uh, what's going on, and as we tiptoed around the world for decades now, um, I've come to realize that we need to switch from being preachers like we tried to do in the 60s and 70s and it very much backfired on us to be very practical, to be able to provide solutions, to be able to put out there ideas which perhaps may appear to be a little utopic but in fact can work very well. And I have wanted to look at where the resources are. And to me, the resources are with the people who have the freedom of mind on one hand and the experience on the other hand. And ultimately, can manipulate what cannot be programmed. We have a tendency in, in our days to want to predict everything, be prepared for rain or stop the rain, be prepared for snow or stop the snow, being able to control a hurricane. Well, it's going to be a while and perhaps it is not to our best interest to do that. But in our effort to predict everything and control everything, we have come to a great deal of frustration. And that is when it comes to the heart. Because the heart is not programmable. You cannot capture it and manipulate it and make of it what you wish to do. And that, I believe, is where we're going to find the resources that will allow us to take care of our planet and in a very successful way will put into action what has been so successful today and that is to be economically sound but at the same time understand things like what sustainability is, like renewal is, like taking care of your backyard which is our little planet. And we're going to do that through the heart. And we can do it with the people who have all of that available and are not completely drowning into every day's obligations where you have to make a house payment, where you have to deal with your banker and your lawyer, where you have to make your car payment, where these things are forcing you to be fundamentally short terms and very, very busy and not have the freedom of spirit to think about what can I do to help and how can I make sure that the next generations will enjoy the quality of life that we have. And one day I was out in Phoenix, Arizona and I was faced with 11,000 young people. And that was the click. That was when I said, let's create the bridge between the young people, the ones who have not yet made a fundamental commitment in life and are like spongers, thirsty for information, absorbing what's out there. And particularly now with the availability of new technologies where we have switched from being 
passive watchers of life going by with the horrible medium of television, not as a medium, but as what we put into it, with hundreds of hours of absolute garbage that comes on on an ongoing basis because it's easy to make an ugly film. It's easy to make a violent film. It's easy to make a film where there's uh, chases and, and crime and uh, drugs and ugliness. It's difficult to make a good film. It's a lot more time consuming and eventually financially consuming, not necessarily every time. And by offering the interactivity and good program which can be put at your disposal when you want, on your own timing, at your own pace, we now can provide through CD-ROM and soon interactive television or live programs where you could very easily, and we're going to do that in the next few months, this year anyway, where we can have a diver underwater speaking to a scientist and linked anywhere in the world through the net, through your television set in the future, where you can go back to those people underwater or anywhere on earth or in space and ask these people questions. We're doing this now with cruise ships and schools and uh, resorts and it works very well. So we have all these formidable tools which can be, instead of misused, properly used for making the bridge. And I know that young people today, they grew up with these computers and we are still scared of them, but they're not. That's part of their life. It's part of their everyday use. And if we can have that, and these formidable brains and resources, the ones who are going to resolve many of the problems that are still in need to be resolved, connect more as they already are with the other side, the fastest growing population, which are the grandparents. Those who have the knowledge, the wisdom, have time, sometimes even resources, and have something more than anyone else, formidable affection and love for their grandchildren. And if we can put all of that together, forget about us, forget about those who are so busy making a living, allow these formidable minds to take care of the future. And that's where we're going now. And that's where we're going and we have believed that in and in and as part of the solutions, we not only want to feature young people in some of our film productions, but we also want to put into action what we've been preaching. And I took upon myself to find a place, a location where there was not just a beautiful marine environment, a beautiful land environment, but there was also one of the most well-preserved, high-quality kinds of people, where those people had fundamental rules in their living standards. A culture which is as rich as you can find it today and very much alive. Because I think we can learn a lot from those people. And as we explore the land and the ocean, we can mix that culture with ours. And I picked the country of Fiji and there we put together a resort which is an experiment, an ongoing laboratory where we address the issue of energy, the issue of water treatment, the issue of what do we eat, how do we protect ourselves from pests, how do we 
learn from, pharma from the people about pharmaceutical products from the jungle, food from the jungle, poisonous and venomous animals, both on land and in the ocean. How do we learn about the fishing techniques which have been around for hundreds of years and have not depleted the reef? All of that is put forward in a facility which looks like a Fijian village because they knew that if you orient your compound in a certain way, you're going to take advantage of the trade winds. And as such, you don't need air conditioning. And on and on and on. So my objective was, and I'm not an hotelier and I never will be, but it was let's have an experiment where we can be environmentally friendly and economically viable. And I'm happy to report to you that we started a year and a half ago and since July we're making money. So it is a complete success story. And we're going to go on until we think that we are done with making it the way it should be. And we're going to tell everybody everything we've learned, good and bad. There's no reasons why we should hide what's going on. I think it can help others. And to complete that, some of all those experiments, I got involved in the Caribbean with the creation of an artificial reef. And that artificial reef is a success story too. By careful planning, taking a structure which in this case was a Russian destroyer, which really was a frigate, that had been abandoned. So we got hold of it, and the first thing we had to do was to clean it up. Major, major undertaking, but we did. And then we had to tow it, and then we had to scientifically sink it, because we didn't want to put it where there's already a reef. We wanted to put it on the sand. We wanted to put it upright. We didn't want it to capsize. And there's a drop-off about 75 feet from the bow, and we didn't want to have it go down to 600 feet of depth. We wanted to stay there so snorkelers, scuba divers, beginners, and, and well-trained could enjoy it. Today, it's in place. We were asked by the government to make it a, uh, a, a, f a film for television. We've completed this film a few days ago, and I would very much like to share with you how, uh, what happened when you make a reef, and the objective is to take away from other parts of the country the pressure that 360,000 scuba divers put upon the reef. We don't want to see the golden goose being choked to death. We want to know what, what is the maximum number of divers that can be there without destroying the reef. And by creating that artificial reef, we can relieve the pressure on other dive sites. And it has worked. It has worked so much so that today there's between 100 and 150 scuba divers going on that shipwreck every day. So it means other sites are not under as much pressure as they used to be. So it was an interesting experience that we did as a collaboration between many different groups of experts uh, from the environment to the political system to the economical system to the local diving industry and, and also the local population. Do they want it? Do they not want it? What is it going to do to the economy locally? Very, very interesting experiment. But in the end, it was done the way it was supposed to be done and it has attracted what we expected it would attract, thus it is helping the rest of it. And to tell you how nature sometimes can be a, a fascinating situation, when, and I was telling some of my colleagues who are here today, uh, I went through a little process out there in the Cayman Islands when I saw so many people going to visit stingrays. There's a place which is called Stingray City. Some of you, I'm sure, have been there. Well, 
They are visited by cruise ships, visited by scuba divers, visited by snorkelers. And there is now three sites because it's growing and growing and growing. And the stingrays love it because people feed them. And the question is, is it right or wrong to feed the animals? Well, life often is a compromise. Perhaps by sacrificing a few stingrays, we are allowing millions of people to learn about these creatures, not be afraid of them. And eventually, they will have a whole new outlook on the marine life, and they will not want to kill them, for example. Because if you kill one of these stingrays, let's say for food, you're going to get $20. Well, by keeping them alive and bringing all these people and creating this huge industry, if you count the number of stingrays that are there, and there are about 300, if you count the number of visitors, and if you count how much money they pay for on each visit, you'll find out that these stingrays are bringing to the immediate economy of this country a round figure of approximately $50,000 a year, each stingray. Multiply that by 300, it's a pretty, pretty good number. Don't want to touch these guys. We want to keep them there, of course. And these are examples of what is happening today and how it's going and it's very exciting because it works. Finally, because I'm here and there are words on these films, I, I will say one thing which normally, if you were seeing it on television, as it will be shown in the next few months in the United States, um, when we decided to sink that ship, I was so close to the project and I felt so comfortable with what they were doing. And I, I grew, grew up on ships. And I have a lot of emotional feelings for ships and, and I'm very attached to ships. Not every ship, but the ones I've been on. And after a few days, getting involved with that particular vessel and uh, thinking about what went on when it was a, a killing machine, and suddenly we were going to take that, that monster, which had cost hundreds of millions of dollars, with uh, missiles and all kinds of things on board. And suddenly, it was all over. And we were going to take it and put it for a peaceful purpose. So I call it destroyer at peace. And symbolically, I felt it was a very, very exciting venture. When I was a child, my father was in the Navy, after World War II was on a minesweeper. Not unlike Calypso, which was built up the coast here in Seattle. And my mother was totally frightened because every time the phone would ring, she felt maybe it was the Navy calling to say your husband blew up on a mine. And that brought back all kinds of discussions, such as the captains going down with their ship. And I could never reconcile with this. I could never feel comfortable. Because captain going down with his ship on a voluntary way is a life taken away. Why? I don't do very well with that. But at the same time, I was very fascinated, and I wondered what does the captain feel like when he goes down with his ship? And here I was working with this, the creation of this artificial reef. And I finally, <laughs> when I felt comfortable that it was going to happen the way they said it was going to happen, gently, not with explosive, but just filling it with water, I decided I'm going to ask permission to go down with the ship. There was a lot of controversies, of course. Some said, you mad, you crazy, no. Others said, mm, we'll think about it. Well, finally, I got permission. And it was a very, very formidable experience. 
and I presale what you're going to see because I was told the ship will sink between 11 and 1 o'clock. Perfect. The lighting was great. I had a job to do. We were going to film. We had six cameras. Some of them I controlled from where I was remotely, three of them, and the others were going to film the event. The challenge was how to make a film on a ship that sinks. It takes 27 seconds. And I'm sitting on that ship after they dumped me there. Sometimes they would come and throw me a bottle of water like you throw peanuts at monkeys in a zoo. But it was a weird feeling to be alone on that huge vessel with 15 boats around looking at you. <laughs> and people were drinking and they were partying and I could hear the music and so on. And here I was uh, in my dry, in my wet suit, uh, which was very wet, not because I went in the water, but it was 90 degrees. And I waited. One o'clock came, nothing. Two o'clock came, nothing. I remember my colleague, uh, Dick Murphy, who said, do you want some water? I said, yes. And he came, threw a bottle of water at me again, and I poured it in my wet suit. I mean, I was so hot, perched way up there. Three o'clock came, nothing. Four o'clock came, nothing. Then I started saying, well, I thought it was very well planned, very scientifically planned. Maybe not so. Maybe this thing is going to capsize. And here I go. Well, it's going to slide on the sand and it's going to go over the edge. I, maybe I should bail out. Well, there's 15 boats out there, a lot of my friends and colleagues, and they're watching me. How can I uh, elegantly get out of here? <laughs> I had a hard time finding an excuse, but some of you divers, you know that you don't dive and fly immediately after that. So I said, oh, I'm flying tomorrow morning. Maybe that's my way out. <laughs> it's too late, I'm flying tomorrow morning. Eh, I don't think it's going to fly very well with those guys. So I went through a nightmare. From a few minutes I thought it was going to take, now it was five o'clock in the afternoon. The sun was starting to set or come down, and I went, oh, it's going to sink at 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't have any lighting. Here goes my film. I've already spent $40,000. It's a catastrophe. But at 5.25, there was more, one more drop, and she went. In 27 seconds, she was down the bow at 95 feet of depth and the stern at 45 feet of depth, and it was a formidable experience. And I hope you will enjoy it as we see for the first time in the public in the United States, uh, Destroyer at Peace. Could we have the film, please? This frigate was built in 1984. After the Cold War, the Russians left it in Cuba. The government of the Cayman Islands decided to purchase it to make it an artificial reef for divers to enjoy. Terry, it's backwards. For over a century, my name is backwards. Built them. Iron ships of death. Where's that famous the bundle you were going to push? Their thundering guns can bring total destruction. Today, the guns of one particular warship are silent as it confronts the demands of peace. The Soviet frigate 356 has a new mission. It will be sunk as a dive attraction off Cayman Brac in the Cayman Islands, south of Cuba. But before that, inspectors from the Cayman Ministry of Environment 
must make sure the ship contains no toxic or radioactive materials that could harm marine life. Possible. After 10 years, Might Dr. Be a, a little interruption Cuba. because we want the film to There's be a lot of work to be the right way for you because there are some words to read and numbers. That's correct. And uh, no access below here. Okay, Don, everything's plugged At our California base, our team go. prepares for the adventure. All right. Good. So it works, huh? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, one that works. Using Why active and well? remote cameras, we will film the sinking of the ship. Murph, hey. I have new maps of uh, Cayman Brock, which uh, will allow us to uh, see where the ship is going to be positioned. Like the ship's going to be there. Well, you remember this ship, which is not a destroyer. It's a nice fighter. Nice the right way. This is how she looks like. What we want to make sure, if this is a drop off, and here it's about four to 600 feet of depth. And this is the coast. And you have a coral head like here. You have another coral head right near the edge. If I'm not mistaken, there's another coral head here. So the ship is gonna be positioned somewhere like here. And it's very difficult because it can slide off and you don't want to go that deep. Here it's going to be retained with an anchor that uh, holds it from the stern. There's another anchor that is going to be positioned here and another anchor here. Uh, from a scientific point of view, do you feel this, this uh, has an interest? Well, sure. It's going to be interesting, first of all, to see when the ship hits the bottom, what kinds of uh, organisms start inhabiting it. Likely, it'll be fish. They're usually the first things to set up house and then subsequently there'll be algae and corals that will settle over a period of weeks. So we, we can come back uh, on a regular basis and film the same same locations? Sure, that'd be great. So there are some currents here, what can we expect? Um, predominantly from the, the west. Is that going to have any kind of uh, impact on the dive? I don't think it'll be um, that considerable. So the ship is going to travel from this port all the way to Cayman Brock, and it's about 150 miles. How long do you think it's going to take? Well, under tow, they're estimating about six knots. We're looking at a good 24 hours a day. The three Cayman Islands are a British crown colony located some 480 miles south of Miami. With over 400 banks, Grand Cayman is famous as a center of international finance. But the Caymans are also a center of tourism. Each year, over one million people visit the islands. And each is treated to a warm communion welcome. Bargain shopping. And some of the best diving in the Caribbean. It is a highly competitive market. Over one third of all visitors to the Caymans are divers, and many more are snorkelers. They come to explore the island's pristine coral reefs and bountiful marine life. At Stingray City, divers can interact with curious rays. offers a more subdued experience. Molly the Manta is a favorite attraction among divers from around the world. Freddy the Grouper is practically a supermodel with his own group of groupies. The Cayman government wants to protect attractions like Molly and Freddy from heavy impact and hopes the destroyer will relieve pressure on sensitive sites. But 
the destroyer project is not without its challenges. From the point of view of your ministry, what kind of obstacles have you had to uh, overcome and what were the problems? My role as Minister for Environment has been to make sure that the product which we are about to place in our waters are in a clean fashion as much as is humanly possible and at the same time we have been very concerned as to its exact location. The ship will be located here, off Cayman Brock, 90 miles northeast of Grand Cayman. It is a lightly visited tropical paradise. Cayman Brock's sandy shelf lacks the teeming reefs of the other islands, making it an ideal location for the destroyer. Steer knows these waters well. She takes me to a small wreck nearby that in only 10 years has become an oasis of life. It provides a glimpse into what the future holds for our destroyer. Fish seeking a place to sleep or reproduce are quick to colonize a wreck. In time, algae begin to grow on the metal surfaces. Gradually, sponges, gorgonians, and corals settle in. Before long, a new world has come into being, a world of colors and complex interactions, where before there was only sand and the endless drift of currents. holds the ship, so the ship itself anchors an entire ecosystem. The Caymans hope the destroyer will attract corals, fish, and of course, tourists. At a cost of nearly $300,000, it is a sizable investment. After years protecting the waters of communist Cuba, the pride of the Red Navy received a hero's welcome in this bastion of capitalism. We are confident that our newest tourism partner, Russian Frigate 356, will provide new and exciting avenue for expanding tourism to the BRAC economy. So it's more than just getting a ship and sinking it and making it a dive place, as far as I'm concerned. It's a way of exploiting, perhaps, some of the uh, ugliest and nastiest side of the humankind into uh, a peaceful, nice, and positive environment. I am sure that I speak for all in the diving community when I say that this is an exciting development and one that we are all convinced will be a major attraction for the Cayman Islands. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know by now how important this ship is and it deserves a very important name. And I present her to you as Captain Keith Tibbetts. up on ships. In many ways, they are all alike, built for convenience and not for comfort. But each has its own life story. 
woven together from the life story of each crew member. The bridge is the brain of the vessel, where decisions of life and death are made. Now, such moments of crisis and courage are only a memory. Workers prepare the warship for peace. First, the tower, a navigational hazard, must be removed. It will join other artifacts in a museum dedicated to the ship. Passageways that might lure curious divers to their doom are welded shut. Doors that might trap divers inside are removed. No possible hazard is ignored. Finally, the job completed. It is anchors away for the final voyage. My old friend Dominique Serafini joins us for the day, sketching his impressions. As always, he captures the romance of the deep like no other. As the destroyer approaches Cayman Brac, I wonder, have the demons of war been banished? From the Department of the Environment, I'm curious to know what problems you had to solve and what does this mean as, I guess, a premier for uh, Cayman Islands? Well, as you know, around all three of the Cayman Islands, we have natural coral reef habitats that are uh, quite pristine and in good shape. And so our main concern was that sinking the wreck didn't uh, delete from the natural habitat that we have. So one of the things we were concerned with was the positioning of the ship and making sure it didn't impact corals as it landed. Uh, the other problem we had to face was making sure there were no toxins on board, like fuels or PCBs or radiation or that type of thing. So from your point of view now, uh, she is acceptable and can become a reef. Yes, we were pleased with the job of cleaning it up and we feel confident that there's no environmental threats present. of anchors positions the destroyer over her final resting place. <laughs> On the eve of her last adventure, the destroyer seems truly at peace, perhaps for the first time in her career. Calmly, she awaits her destiny. Without ceremony, at 6 o'clock in the morning, workers begin to flood the ballast tanks. We are all now working against the clock. Ghost cameraman will record the sinking of the ghost ship. You know how to fire them. I will focus it. I have decided to yield to my curiosity and go down with the ship myself. Right I will ride on the anti-aircraft radar tower. Wait, wait, Gary. You have to keep putting on this one. Okay. Yeah. On the bridge, remote cameras will capture the oh, sight man, no captain good. ever wishes to see. You see me? No, you're doing good. Okay, I see Là. the middle of your face. Là, parce que tu vois ça. Attends. Wow. 
One wakes it up. Right. Two makes it roll. It's not as easy Three as it looks. Stops it. Four, Four puts no. it asleep. She's ready, and so am I. For the first time in my life, I'm eager to board a sinking ship. Once, when I was a child, I received news that my father's minesweeper had been damaged on patrol. I knew that captains often went down with the ship. I feared he would also answer this macabre call to duty. And with a boy's dark imagination, I wondered what it would be like. Now, I am about to find out. The boat arrives to take the workers off the ship. Their good spirits are infectious, and I wish they could stay. First time, I'm truly alone on the ship. What must they be like, the final moments of a dying ship? their honor and courage? Or are we reduced to blind panic in the face of death? It is time to put on the tax, a luxury that doomed sailors don't have. Hours have passed, and still the ship clings stubbornly to life. She lists to starboard. The danger of capsizing is in the air. There is still time to abandon the ship. But then, a final burst of air, and we begin to slip under. Then a strange sleeping sensation as a sandy bottom rises to embrace us. The sea fills with the dirge of groaning metal and the fading heartbeat of cracking decks. Her agony at an end. I'm compelled to explore. It is an eerie watch along empty decks, still exhaling their last breath of air. A visitor from the world of the living, Sue, is a welcome sight.
together we make the rounds. I switch off the remote cameras. Today, they have recorded a death. Soon, they will paint the vivid picture of a splendid rebirth. For the present, we immerse ourselves in the many moods of the wreck dive, somehow hearing the echo of the guns and feeling that the drama of a ship's life stays with it, even here at the bottom of the sea. undersea epitaph. Life arrives almost immediately. A long barracuda surveys the hull. The stingray, a bottom dweller, pays a visit, accompanied by an inquisitive jack. After years at sea, the ship's bottom is a carpet of barnacles and oysters, an attractive home for these yellow-tailed snappers. Sergeant Majors, aggressive patrolman of the reef, inspect their new base amid the barnacles. A grouper has joined the snappers. Is this the next undersea supermodel? Only time will tell. The wreck teaches us that all glory is fleeting. And where a weapon of destruction has become a protective shelter, time is on the side of life. Uh, with us the writer of the script who is a resident of Portland, Steve Krolak. I very much enjoy his work and it was our first experience on a film with Steve who has worked with me for many years now on other capacities and uh, I think he's done a formidable job. Well, let's dream. The limits are your imagination. And to dream is, I believe, what will keep us going and we'll be able to find the solutions, we'll be able to help maintain that quality of life, restore some of the damage that we've done, and be proud to turn this 
beautiful planet of ours to the next generation in a, as good condition, if not better, than we found it. It is a big task. It is a formidable undertaking. But I am convinced that we can do it. The heart is unlimited. And the dreams ought as well. I'd like to leave you after uh, this film. We'll have a question and answer period if you feel like it. But I'd like to leave you with a, uh, a remake of a film that I had made, a short film that I had made, dealing with gelatinous plankton. Don't go away. Please stay here. <laughs> because I'm going to change your mind. This yucky stuff, like jellyfish and, you know, these things which we did really don't want to have anything to do with. I myself had really not paid attention to for a long, long time. And it's only a few years back that uh, one night uh, we were on board our, our ship, which was drifting at night because we could not anchor near that little island. There was no space for anchorage. So the ship was drifting, and every morning we would motor back to the island, do our work, and then the next night we drift. <laughs> so here we were with three, four, five thousand feet of depth under the keel of the ship. And one night I said to my friends on board, I said, instead of just sitting there and sipping French wine, why don't we go and have a dive and see what's under the keel of the ship? What do you think, guys? Absolutely no reaction. <laughs> so I named a few volunteers. <laughs> and we went down, and I couldn't keep them out of the water from that day on. Late in the afternoon, after the sun had set, or early in the morning before the sun rise, we would take a dive. And within about 60 feet of depth, we focused on the animal part of plankton, the zooplankton, and we brought our artificial lights, which are white light like these lights, and we filmed them. And I can tell you, the source of inspiration, the creativity of nature, the ability for us to dream and take this and perhaps do the next century Star Trek or Star War or 2000 and whatever <laughs> is absolutely endless. And I've only scratched the surface. And I hope that uh, with this remake of this little film, you're going to be able to see some of these creatures. At first, we'll present them to you the way they are, and then you're going to wonder what scale. Well, we'll bring the divers ultimately, and we'll put the divers next to it so you can see the scale. And that to me is perhaps an indication that not only do we know very little, but we have a long way to go if we want to know more. The ocean is loaded with unknown species. The land is loaded with unknown species, and hopefully we can slow down the disappearance of some of them which may disappear even before we know them because it's out there great great inspiration discovery research science in a few weeks i'm going to be on the great barrier reef working with people who are discovering pharmaceuticals from the reefs in a few weeks i'm going to be with scientists who are doing core samples in the reef for a period of over two to three hundred years, and they're going to be able to, through chemistry, tell us exactly what temperature happens every year, just like you look at a tree and the rings of a tree and you learn. There we're going to know, and perhaps that will tell us if global warming is a real issue or if it has repeated itself, if we are responsible or nature is responsible or we both are responsible. I mean, there's so many things out there that can still be done and discovered. Again, inspiration comes from that beautiful environment of ours. And when you see this and you see some colors, 
don't be surprised, this color is due to de refraction. In other words, all white lights are broken down into the different colors of the rainbow. And that's due to the refraction and the propulsion system of some of these creatures. I really hope you'll enjoy it, and I'll be right back after this short presentation. Could we have the film, please? is a long leader.
follow your dreams. I hope that uh, this enormous amount of time that you've uh, devoted tonight and for which I'm extremely grateful has been worthwhile. I'd like to uh, now bring the lights in the audience so we can open a short period of question and answer and uh, you can ask me questions about any subject, any topic, I'll try to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If you feel like it, go ahead. Okay. Good evening. As you said, with 90 million more mouths to feed every year, yes. can we look to the ocean as a source of food to solve the ever-growing problem of world famine, or has the ocean already been depleted and we need to find another way to solve this problem? The answer is no, we cannot look at the ocean. It's a misconception. We're already harvesting from the ocean more than we should and as such we are depleting the resources. Instead of uh, only uh, taking the surplus, like if you have a bank account and you uh, live off the interest on your capital, uh, you're okay. If you start to gobble up your capital, which is what we're doing with pretty much everything on land, but particularly where we're not farming, which is the ocean, uh, we're depleting those resources at a very, very fast pace. The hope, the secret, the answer is to uh, identify some of those species which ultimately we can reproduce at a fast pace for quantity rather than the taste. Uh, the efforts, unfortunately, too often are put in the wrong kinds of species. For example, growing lobsters. That's not going to resolve the, the world food problem. But um, we should focus on fast growing species and probably do that in control, a control environment. Because if you do it in the ocean itself, like we do it in, in, do it in a semi control environment with salmon, uh, you may have problems like we've had with the Exxon Valdez when the accident took place. Ultimately, the hatchlings, which were released and went through the water column, which had been affected by the spill and detergent and whatnot, has affected these baby salmons, which came back two years later, smaller in smaller numbers and with some uh, deformity, deformity. As a result, we are now manufacturing genetically defective salmon because of the spill. And this is happening right now. So, uh, probably, ideally, the solution is to uh, grow species in a control environment in a massive way, like perhaps we do with chicken and other species on land. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, thanks for coming. You're welcome. I wanted to ask you, um, I've been very concerned about the uh, nuclear testing in the ocean, and uh, I was curious to know First of all, how did the French uh, government manage to convince themselves it was all right to do that? And also, what kind of studies are, or follow-up have they done in terms of long-term damage, or was there damage, or what is the result of the testing? Well, the nuclear tests which have taken place worldwide, uh, and unfortunately in the case of France, in the South Pacific at a very inappropriate time since the world population has expressed itself very, very specifically against those tests. And the government, uh, despite public opinion, has gone ahead and unfortunately conducted those programs. Uh, the good news is that the pressure was such that ultimately they stopped before they completed all the tests they wanted to, do, to make. And, uh, it's a form of arrogance which I believe is totally unacceptable. And uh, uh, the, the tests are now uh, done and over with forever, uh, I hope. Uh, 
The consequences from a political point of view, I think, will be long lasting because the, the uh, uh, government is still getting a lot of flack about that. The um, physical consequences locally are not yet measurable, although we know that from a purely mechanical point of view, we've been able to observe some cracks in the reef. Now, those cracks are visible. What uh, has turned out to be negative is all the water samples that were, were taken at that time and do not show any release of radioactivity. So that's the good news at that time. Uh, there is a need to keep an eye on what's going on on an ongoing basis and definitely not allow people to, uh, to stay within the vicinity for a long time. Um, there are other nuclear threats in other parts of the world. Uh, in our own backyard with some of the plants which are threatening to have problems and accidents. And when I say backyard, it doesn't mean the United States necessarily. Uh, you, you know of Chernobyl and we have quickly forgotten what's going on, but there are still today uh, youngsters, babies that are born deformed or with a form of cancer or another at a pace which is much higher than anywhere else. So we know that it's directly linked to the accident. And uh, there are near accidents all the time in many parts of the world, in France amongst others, where you have more nuclear energy per inhabitant than you find anywhere in the rest of the world. The percentage of energy uh, provided by uh, nuclear plants. Um, I think we will come to a good census, fundamentally from an economical point of view, because we're not really paying the real price. We are passing on to the next generations some of the price, such as keeping of the waste, dismantling the plants. None of that appear on your bill, but we enjoy the the uh, energy that is provided that way and the price that will come out of this orgy that we have experienced will be passed on to next generations with absolutely nothing to give to them uh, as part of the price. So I think there's an element of unfairness there and uh, we fundamentally lying to ourselves and lying to uh, the ones we are borrowing the planet from. So. Uh, I think we need to re-evaluate all of this as uh, globally as, as a species. There's somebody up there. Good evening, Mr. Cousteau. Uh, yeah. I have two questions. The first would be, what is your favorite part of what you do? And the second is, what advice would you give to a young student who is interested in becoming involved with the study of the ocean? Yay. I pretty much like everything I do, otherwise I wouldn't do it. I don't have to. Uh, I can focus in one part or another. The only thing that changes from one project to another is the technique that we use to convey the same message. And whether I'm involved in making presentations, doing CD-ROM, uh, organizing and, and conducting educational programs, making a film for television, or uh, designing a museum like we are now in uh, New London and Connecticut, or involved in uh, any aspect of environmental issues connected to the water system, whether it's fresh water or salt water, I enjoy it very much. And uh, when it comes to uh, people who have a, a a desire to accomplish something like you appear to in the ocean environment, you're going to have to identify what it is that you want to uh, uh, accomplish with your studies so later on you, uh, you will be able to use that uh, 
document, a diploma, as a key to open all kinds of doors. Uh, you have to go through that process, but you can become a scientist, you can become a researcher, you can become a writer, you can become a photographer or a cinematographer. I'll tell you, when I deal with a cinematographer or a photographer who's also a biologist, then, then I know we understand each other, I know they, are, they understand the, the behavior of the marine life, thus uh, they can create a story without having to uh, be yelled at by a scientist or by myself or, or to, to make sure they, they realize that they, they have not missed uh, the story. Uh, a film is a story, it's not a bunch of pretty images and unless you know what's going on out there, you're going to miss out. So there, there's all kinds of opportunities that are offered and you have to decide if you want to be happy and what you do makes you happy. Or if you, unfortunately, I hear too often, want to become rich. Because you can make millions of dollars and be one of the saddest person on earth. Money is not gonna make you happy. It's a tool. You're gonna make yourself happy. And uh, follow your dreams and, you, and you'll have a formidable life. And that's, that's the best recommendation I can make. Sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's tough. You may work uh, as a bartender or uh, uh, sweeping uh, people's uh, garbage at Disneyland, but I have a lot of respect for those guys because they are the ones who have a goal. They have an objective and they are challenging themselves all the time to do what they want to do. And I think that's the way to look at life. So good luck to you. Merci. You're welcome. <laughs> yes, yes. <clears throat> uh, Tom, I just want to ask you one. Tom Doggett earlier asked, said you would say more about Pacific Ocean Search and how it's evolved, and I, I'm just very impressed well, with that. Well, Project you Ocean Search is uh, uh, a desire that I had because of all of you. Uh, my father started making motion pictures and, and television shows and a lot of people wrote and offered to contribute and help on their, uh, with their knowledge on our expeditions and of course it, it was pretty much impossible to, to allow thousands of people to join us on expeditions and that's when we created Project Ocean Search which became somewhat of an educational program where we were able, away from the normal Cousteau activities, to recreate an expedition, kind of, in a given location somewhere in the world where you could participate. And we did that since 1973. That has taken us with people for, of all works of life, and I just lost someone who dearly affected my life, and it was a young man from Fresno, California, whose job was to drive a truck carrying, which was carrying almonds. And one day he decided, he had a little money aside, his parents helped him, he decided to come on one of our trips. And we went to Papua New Guinea. And he was out there in Papua New Guinea for a month. And I remember he sent a postcard to his mother and it says, Mom, I'm here. There are all kinds of big trees here it's like Disneyland, but the trees are real. <laughs> and he just passed away uh, uh, because of uh, disease and, and unfortunately we've lost a good friend there, but somebody whose life had been changed forever. And I think the experience of Project Ocean Search is precisely to do that. Now, being in the ocean environment, the ocean world, I, I'm today faced with a, an enormous opportunity. There's a need to collect data, and this data needs to be focused somewhere in some universities and research labs and so on, where scientists can pros process this data and, and use it for their research. There's not enough money, there's not enough scientists to go out there and explore the ocean and collect the data. But we have a formidable army. And those are the snorkelers and the divers. People who 
loves the ocean and wants to explore and wants to understand it better. So by making deals with a uh, whole uh, series of uh, uh, results in the Bahamas, for example, we have 24 results where we educate the, uh, the guides or the instructors who are for the most part scuba instructors but they can also take people snorkeling to look at the reef and take that, collect data both with video and cameras doing quadrats and transects and then that will be focused or sent to a data center where there it can be taken by different institutions. In the United States only there's 1.6 million scuba divers. What an army of people who can help us. So we're putting in place in different parts of the world, the Bahamas was our pilot project, we're working now with Bermuda and we're in the process of we're doing it at our resort in Fiji. Uh, we have a fleet or I have a relationship with a fleet of liveaboard ships which are called the aggressive fleet where you take uh, 10, 15, 20 scuba divers who are avid scuba divers and want to take photography, they take photography class, we can process their film and so on on board and now with the help of the crew these people can also help collect data. So right on those ships in 10 and soon to be 12 very beautiful locations in the tropics, four in the Caribbean, six in the Pacific, we have these people, about 6,000 people every year day after day after day can collect data which then will be sent and processed scientifically. So we're not scientists but we are collectors of data and by uh, uh, multiplying this, we're trying to work with, uh, with Hawaii, I'll be in Hawaii soon to, to start that program, uh, I think we can make major changes, major projects and that's part of our project, uh, project Ocean Search experience which uh, we have conducted since the 73 but it has now taken a different shape because of this opportunity to deal with the public. I see a young person there who has a question. Go for it. Um, I was wondering what, you're, what you were thinking when the ship was going <laughs> down <laughs> and... <laughs> I was thinking about you. <laughs> uh, it, it was a... I was very well prepared but a few things happened which I did not expect. The first one is that a few seconds before the ship went down, as you heard it on the film, all these vessels around started blowing their horn. And that really got to me. Uh, it was a big surprise. Then as the, my head went right through the water, uh, all these sounds disappeared, but new sounds took place. And some of those were, and we try to reproduce it, it doesn't come out as much as I experienced it, cracks. And these cracks were when the ship, the stern of the ship hit the bottom first and then the bow gently came down. And the reason for that is that most of the superstructures of the ship were on, in the front of the ship and captured a lot of air. And, and that air kept the bow from going down as fast as the stern. So the stern touched the bottom, the ship was a little bit on its side as you saw it on the starboard side, the right side, and as it right itself up, it created a torque effect and some of the uh, superstructure decks split open. Like if you were to pull on a sheet of paper. Yeah. And these, these uh, at the time of these splitting, it was like a machine gun. And that really got me. Uh, because I was hanging on my handrail there and I heard ta -ta 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 -ta. I mean it was just horrible. War was happening again. And uh, finally, I, I, uh, these sounds started slowing down and I was looking over the edge and I saw these huge clouds of sand coming toward me and they were kind of moving away. And my um, reaction which was a, a miss, uh, a, a confusion was that the clouds were not moving away, the ship was moving away. It was sliding on the sand and it was going to go over the edge. 
And I was horrified, just as I was kind of going, what am I going to do? Then I realized, no, 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 no. The ship is not moving. The clouds are moving. So then I was fine. So I calmed down, and that's when I, I went right over the edge. I don't know if you remember that image where I started diving down, and then Sue appeared. And when Sue appeared, I felt real good. And the rest of... <laughs> West, uh, she's, she's a beautiful lady too. But the rest of my team showed up and uh, everything calmed down. Now I was down there for 73 minutes. And what's interesting is that after less than half an hour, there were five species of fish. Today, there are between 15 and 20 species of fish. The ship went down in September. Today, there's between 15 and, and 20 species of fish. There are lobsters. There are all kinds of nudibranchs, which are like uh, snails or, or uh, slugs, and there are uh, sea urchins, and we still we start to see some buds of different kinds of corals and sea fans and uh, sponges, a lot of sponges will happen here. From a scientific point of view, it's very interesting because we're going to be able to go back on a regular basis and put our cameras where they were and film the evolution and the occupation of space by the marine life. And that's going to be very interesting scientifically over time, both what lives there but also what attach to the ship. Uh, so we're looking forward to doing this. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll do more uh, of these kinds of experiments in other places because it really takes away the pressure from some of the dive sites. Thank you. I want to thank you for coming and awakening my own interest in scuba diving. Uh, what I was wondering about, I was saddened to hear about the destruction of the Calypso in Singapore Harbor. What happened? Uh, Calypso was, at, uh, um, was uh, in, in the harbor on, on uh, the dock, and uh, a barge, a loose barge, which was pulled by a tug, kind of slid on the surface of the water and went completely out of control. And the corner of the barge, which is made out of metal, uh, went right through the hull of Calypso, which is wood, and uh, made a hole sufficiently big under the, the uh, water line, and she went down in three minutes. Fortunately, there was uh, nobody hurt, uh, 16 feet of water, she was on her side, and she was there for a few days. Ultimately, she was uh, floated up and uh, put on a barge and towed to France. She's now in south of France in Marseille and will never sail again. She's uh, completely out of commission, everything's corroded and damaged in the ship. Uh, she was old anyway, and my father was thinking about retirement uh, at that time. So she's kind of a Still monument in some ways, but uh, she'll never sail again. Yes. Okay. We're Generation X, and we already have strikes against us, and we have the power to destroy or save the Marine. And like you said, that we need to get the Marine ready for the next generation. But what are you or the government doing to get the youth ready for the Marine? Well, I don't know about government because they come and go, and it's all decisions. I'm here, and I'm here to stay, and so are many of my colleagues. So there's a big difference there, and I, I, will, I will work with whoever we put in place, whether I agree or not. This is democracy. So um, what we're doing is to uh, endlessly share our concern and also the beauty of this planet because people protect what they love. And if we can make you love it, you're not gonna go and kill it and destroy it. So this is one of our main, main uh, action. Now, one of the projects which is presently in the making is to have young people take over in our films. This is a television series that we are working on where we're going to feature young people as they tiptoe and discover the world. And they'll represent different ethnics and different parts of the world. And as they go and visit, let's say, the Yucatan Peninsula, there they're going to find out, as they meet local young people who become their guides, that the Mayans are still alive, 
that they are beautiful uh, architecture to be, to be uh, understood and discovered. And the reason why the Mayans were there was well, there's a lot of fresh water which is under the ground, the famous cenotes, all the underwater caves with absolutely crystal clear, pure fresh water. And we'll understand the, the, the land life of uh, uh, certain animals like uh, crocodiles and alligators and whatnot. And then as we go into the ocean, uh, we see shipwrecks and manatees and uh, different species of sharks and which are all reachable. And then we go out and go to the blue halls in Belize, for example, where you have uh, this formidable geological formation. So we'll explore that in the stalagmites and stalagmites underwater, 120 feet or so. And, and in the process of exploring, discovering, understanding, we're learning a lot of stuff. And I think by having these young people be the actors and the adventurers will attract a lot of other people, young people, who are going to watch their, peer, their peers at work. And uh, rather than watching uh, Hawaii Five-0, <laughs> That was old, that was a long time ago. They're gonna watch these kinds of shows. And th th these are some of the projects we have in the making. We've produced already two CD-ROM because I think CD-ROMs are what young people want to have access to. And uh, instead of being, dealing with killing machines, we, we're dealing with life. And uh, I think it's doing pretty well. Thank you. You're welcome. You uh, will be the last one, sir. Again, thank you for visiting. You're welcome. Uh, last fall, we had Dr. Robert Ballard here who discussed the need for protecting underwater monuments such as the Titanic. Could you comment on that from your perspective? Well, I have a lot of respect for Dr. Ballard. I know him personally well. I think he's done a formidable service to uh, humanity, particularly with his project, Jason, and I encourage and support that considerably. Uh, to protect underwater monuments may, may be uh, futile in some ways. What I think we should do is not touch them. Leave them alone. It doesn't cost anything. They've been there for a long time, particularly at that depth where everything is preserved. There are people, hundreds of people, who have died there. And I think they need to be respected. And it's their grave. Thus, I think we should leave things the way they are. I completely object to uh, going to take things out of these places. And uh, as such, uh, I think it's very simple. It's no, <laughs> don't touch them and they'll be preserved. We can go and look at them, that's fine. It's just like paying homage and respect. But uh, the fact that uh, there are people who for profit reasons uh, are, are going to pillage some of these uh, graves, I think it's totally unacceptable. Well, thank you very much. I know we've, uh, Thank you again, we've abused your time. Uh, I take it very personally because it, it's a sign of uh, uh, the, uh, the interest that you had tonight and I'm very honored of it. Uh, I hope that uh, Terry will invite me back at least within the next four years because this is a very, very special place. Good night, thank you very much. Thank you.